thanks for joining me today. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I want to I want to give you a chance to talk about um, uh, the work that you're doing, um, but I kind of want to give a, a framing um, for that. Um, and the the the, the framing um, has to do with a process that I call typification, um, which is lifting from um, an instance, uh, like in the case of Rolang, this would be a specific um, a, a process definition or contract definition um, to a type. And this is something that we can do uh, fairly readily <coughs> because of the way um, uh, the, the types follow the structure of the, uh, of the, um, the term language. Um, so, so one way to illustrate this is with a, um, a process definition that I sketched out about a year ago, um, which I called the uh, square root of a process. So I'm going to um, just refresh and remind people who've been following the, uh, our cast um, uh, what that looks like. And then we can talk about, um, you know, sort of the relevance of, of this kind of um, uh, notion uh, into a, a wider set of um, ideas. Okay, um, so just uh, I want to remind um, you and the, the, the folks who might be following along um, the definition of the square root of a process. So the idea is the square root of a process P in par with the square root of P is, needs to be bisimilar to P. So it's just like normal square root in multiplication, except it has a, um, an interesting interpretation in terms of fault tolerance. Yeah. So we have a, a couple of copies of a process that when, when we um, run them in parallel, they, uh, they produce some, some um, potentially larger process. And <laughs> if you think about how Casper works, that's essentially the heart of Casper, right? So we've got a bunch of nodes. All of them are running um, an instance of some smart contract um, P. Um, and, uh, but when Casper's done, it's as if only one instance of P ran. So they're in different copies, all running in parallel, but, only, but in terms of the effects seen by the outside world, only one instance of that ran. So it's a, it's a kind of fault tolerance. That's what the consent, that's one of the things the consensus is, is providing. Uh, and that, that fits in with the, the obvious generalization of the square root, which is the nth root. So if we have, <coughs> if we have n different copies of the nth root of P all running in parallel with each other, then that should be bisimilar to P. So there's a clear, clear connection to, to, um, to Casper in that way. So, so does Casper do some kind of equivalent of taking a smart contract and splitting it into n copies so that it satisfies this equivalence or? No, uh, Casper does what I'm <laughs> about to, uh, something a little closer to what I'm about to sh- show you here, which is to coordinate amongst the different um, um, processes. Uh, so effectively what it does is it, it guarantees that they all agree on the winner of a race. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what it's doing. So it's not like slicing and dicing P um, so much as, uh, you know, um, if there's any, um, if there's any possibility of non-determinism that's eradicated or eliminated. Yeah. Uh, in the sense, not in the sense that the program is be- has become um, deterministic, but rather that they all share exactly the same uh, non-deterministic choices. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so the question is, can we calculate um, a root from the definition of a process? And um, it's relatively straightforward, at least initially, until we get to par. So you can kind of, you know, the, the square root of zero is zero. Um, the square root of a four comprehension is mostly just pushing the square root through 
the square root of an output is mostly just pushing the square root through. Um, the square root of a, of a drop is the drop of the, or, or D quote is the, um, the uh, D quote of the square root. Um, but when you, and, and when you have a par where there's no interaction, um, then, um, <laughs> then the square root of the par is just the uh, par of the square roots. Mm -hmm. But if there is interaction, then you have to introduce additional coordination. Um, and, and we can see that um, because um, if you were to not do that for a race, when you took the square root of a race condition, um, you get the possibility of different, um, <coughs> of different uh, winners of the race. Um, so that's what, the, that's what that, um, the slide that you can see, but the listeners can't is, is showing. It's just that if we, if we were naive, if we were to naively take the square root of a, of a par that involved the race, then then we put, would potentially get something that is not by by similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we have to do is um, to introduce when when we have a race in a par, we have to introduce an additional um, uh, uh, coordination constraint, uh, a process C, such that when you take C in par with itself it makes the same choice for both copies. So this is very similar to Casper, right? Because not only do you have um, it, different copies of the node running, I mean, of the process P running, you also have different copies of the node running. So you literally do have a CRC happening um, uh, in, in the Casper setting. Yep. Um, and so, so you know, as I, as I mentioned on, in the podcast a year ago when I covered this, um, there's a kind of beast or freak uh, solution where <coughs> um, you flip a coin, bo both copies flip a coin, um, they both uh, reach out for the, um, for the outcomes of the two coin flips. It doesn't matter which one uh, gets, the, uh, gets the two copies. Uh, one of them will get both, both flips, uh, and, then, and then you can divide um, uh, the flip outcomes into uh, two different cases. The, the beast case where you have a head and a tail or a tail and a head uh, and the freak case where you either have two heads or two tails. Mm -hmm. um, and then that will select the choice um, and then you make sure that you, you put the coin flips back out so that the other copy of C can get that and, and it will follow the same choice, obviously. So again, there's no leader, there's no trust uh, apart from the fact that the the, uh, the coordinating device, the C thing, has to uh, ensure that it passes on the the outcomes that it got. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's the the main um, uh, uh, um, coordinating gadget, and and you can see that this generalizes to n <laughs> in cases. Um, and I leave that for leave that as an exercise for the listener. Um, so now the question is, um, uh, uh, what would this look like from the point of view of a type? Um, so the, the, the question that we have is, is there the notion of, if I have a formula phi, is there a square root of phi? Uh, and and what, do, what does the specification for that look like? Uh, so there are all kinds of interesting questions that happen even at this level. And, uh, you know, in preparation for this uh, podcast, uh, Christian and I sort of had, had exactly this discussion. <laughs> um, so in particular, um, so, so we, we can kind of, uh, if we look at the original equation, the original equation is the square root of P part of the square root of P is bisimilar to P. So we know on one side, we want the square root of phi par the square root of phi. And we know we can form that because we have type constructors that correspond to the, the term constructor of, of parallel composition. Um, and uh, so that's gonna be on one side and on the other side, you're gonna have phi, but what's in the middle, right? What replaces by simulation? Because we don't have by simulation of formulae. Uh, we do have a notion of logical equivalence uh, right, so this would be that the square root of phi par the square root of phi 
um, happens uh, to be true if and only if um, the uh, fee uh, also happens to be true. Or another, in, instead of saying it happens to be true, we say that the, the same set of processes that, uh, um, that uh, satisfy the left-hand side would satisfy the right-hand side. Um, yeah. and, and so, <coughs> so that, uh, that is exactly um, a characterization or lies at the heart of the relationship between formulae and processes and the sense that there's a, a theorem that we want to be true um, that uh, of any of these type systems that we might devise um, that the two processes are bisimilar if and only if um, all the processes that validate uh, or, or you know each process validates exactly the same set of formulae yeah uh, so that's that's a, a way to say it. And so, so this formulation um, uh, sort of is in perfect alignment with that idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so so do, do you want to sort of take, before we go into the calculations, do you want to sort of t take a, a, a moment to talk a little bit about how you would be interpreting the left-hand side of that, if and only if? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, for if we present uh, the row calculus as a as an algebraic theory that has the constructors and equations for structural congruence, and then also rewrites um, for the reduction rules, uh, in the framework that we're currently using each constructor um, can be lifted to the level of types and um, can actually be lifted in, in a bunch of different ways and they're all useful. Uh, but in this case, one, one way that you could take a constructor on the level of processes and lift it to the level of types is if we think about par as a binary operation on processes, uh, on the level of types, if you have some subset of processes, you could, um, <clears throat> there's a way to take essentially the pre-image, uh, if you're thinking of that operation as a function, you could think about taking the pre-image uh, of some subset of processes corresponding to this formula phi. Uh, and if you took, so this isn't quite uh, what you're looking for, Greg, but it's just the um, the closest thing that we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, if you take the pre-image, then you get the set of all pairs of processes so that when you put them in parallel, they are in the type of phi. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, uh, if you think about it for a minute, it's a little bit different than asking for a single type called square root of phi so that um, w I mean I'm assuming that you want this type to be um, exactly how we are thinking about it for the level of processes so you would want um, it is the well, well no 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 you're, you're getting it right right at the nub of the issue that, that mm -hmm. I want to expose yeah. um, so so one of the things that uh, so you're looking at it from the model theoretic point of view so you're you're looking at operations that are um, associated with the interpretation of the formula um, and and the, but the question is could we also do a calculation on the formula itself in the same way that we do a calculation on the um, on the the process, right? And so one of the one of the more interesting things is that we can um, we can certainly lift all of the equational spec um, straight up, right? So okay. the square root of the formula zero is equal to zero, mm -hmm. and the square root of the formula um, for beta from alpha. So these are now named spaces. Um, phi is, you know, uh, for the square root of beta from the square root of alpha, square root of phi. 
mm -hmm. and so on for, for each of those places where we can just push the definition through. And so now is the, <coughs> the interesting question, is there a type um, for the... <coughs> oh, interesting. For, for C. Um, and it, it turns out that there is, um, uh, a, <coughs> and you can be sort of as, uh, you, you, how do I say this? You can make C be as tight or as loose as you want it to be. Um, and this is because, you know, <laughs> um, a term is a type, right? And it's, it's, a, it's interpretation is just going to be a singleton. But uh, so, so we could just make C itself be the formula in the same way that zero is a formula. But we can, uh, we can also loosen it. So for example, we can insist that <coughs> that C um, only looks at the, the, uh, the alpha um, uh, namespace, um, or we can insist some other things um, uh, with respect to uh, the way the outputs happen. Um, so. So it, what exactly is the interpretation of the square root of V? Well, um, if you give me a formula phi, I can calculate uh, a, a new formula, square root of phi. And then we can run your model theoretic. So, so this is where we get a, an interesting um, uh, uh, um, potential proof obligation, right? So I can, I can calculate a new formula. And, um, and then we can ask whether that formula uh, the interpretation of that using your model theoretic interpretation is equal to um, the models that you get from the pre-image calculation. Does that make sense? I think so. so um. <clears throat> quite likely what will happen is that the formula that I calculate will be smaller than the pre-image. The reason is because there are potentially other ways of coordinating apart from C that will guarantee the same thing. So for example, one way is you just, you just pick a winner. You say it's always, you know, uh, it's always the left-hand side or the right-hand side or, you know, mm -hmm. right. You flip a coin and pick a winner. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's something that's not like C, um, but, uh, uh, <laughs> will result in the, the, the same kind of thing, right? So, so, so uh, specifically, I was laboring with a um, heavier set of requirements, namely that um, the C had to be leaderless, so it had to, had to enjoy a particular kind of symmetry. Does, it, does that make sense? Uh, symmetry with respect to what? So, uh, so, so there, um, so there's an asymmetry that that has to do with you know picking a leader, but 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 C, um, C enjoys the property that that C in par with C, so there's no particular leader, um, is going to get the uh, get the everyone to agree on the choices, mm -hmm. right? So so that's the symmetry I'm talking about. Yep. Um, and so I, uh, uh, so I don't know how to, th that's like meta level information. I, I don't know how to encode that at the level of the type. It's more like kind information, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, I, I don't know how to encode that. And so, uh, but, but it, but, you know, it was a particular desideratum to make it as Casper like as possible. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so the, the formula that I calculate will not be, uh, um, or it'll be small. The, the, inter the model theoretic interpretation will be smaller than, um, the, mo the straight up pre-image calculation that you were giving earlier. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, But I mean, uh, just 
just as a as like a set of processes the square root of phi are the processes so that if you put them in if you took p in square root of phi and then you picked any other q in square root of phi then p par q is in by, phi but, but yeah exactly or exactly. or by similar to something in phi yeah by similar to something in phi oh which okay should, which should be the same as you know uh, square root of phi par square root of phi if and only if phi yeah right. yeah okay so, so 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 there's a little bit of a proof obligation right there right we, we, we want to make sure that 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 is the case yes um, uh, just just that alone that that if we if we pick uh, a p from that and a q uh, a p from the interpretation of the square root and a q from the interpretation of the square root and we put them in par then that process will be bisimilar to p um for uh, for some uh, p prime for some p prime living in the interpretation of phi yeah right and then we want to show that that is exactly uh, that happens if and only if the square root of phi part of the square root of phi if and only if phi yeah yeah that's tricky that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Maybe it's worthwhile to kind of uh, 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 take a step up um, so that people understand why this might be interesting or relevant um, with respect to both Casper research and, and ladle research and, and just wider concerns. Mm -hmm. So um, w one of the things that I um, have been thinking about a lot and have talked about a lot, uh, certainly I've talked about it a lot in 2017 and 2018, in 2019, I didn't talk about it as much because we were sort of down in the, in the uh, you know, n nose to the ground uh, trying to get the network out. But um, the, the, the fact is that there will be heterogeneous uh, blockchain networks. That's just a fact. I mean, it's already a fact now, right? There's, there's lots of networks. There's Ethereum, there's EOS, there's, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Chain. Um, so there, it's already a fact that there are heterogeneous networks and people are interested in cross network behavior. That's exactly what exchanges provide. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and in fact, there are projects like Polkadot who explicitly recognize that cross chain behavior is, is, is a real thing. It's important. Um, but what you'd like to do is to prove end to end correctness. And, um, <clears throat> Being able to typify um, some consensus mechanism uh, would allow us to look at um, <clears throat> the end-to-end -end, uh, correctness of you know, behavior in um, a, a heterogene heterogeneous um, network of networks. Yeah. Um, and and you know, so this this happens not only at the at the level of you know the wild and woolly internet. It also happens, um, and will happen more and more and more as we start to see internet on a chip. So part of the reason that you know, we looked at FPGA implementations uh, back in Microsoft in the early two thousands, and then my son and I looked at it again um, in twenty eighteen is because um, with, with FPGA technology, you can, you can have you know, um, a bunch of different chips um, tiled on the FPGA surface. Yeah. The field programmable gate arrays would allow you to put you know, essentially a bunch of different computers all on, all on one FPGA surface. Um, and they might be following uh, different protocols. So for example, you could have, you know, a bunch of row chips on the surface, but you have an ambient, um, an ambient chip uh, for, um, for uh, or a network of ambient chips um, for delivering uh, work out to the, the leaves of a tree. So you have some, 
some tree uh, or the, the nodes are organized in a tree even though they're not tiled on the surface like a tree. So there's a logical tree. Um, the ambient stuff is, is, is routing work to the leaves and the leads are, the leaves are um, uh, row calculus chips that are, are going to do the work. So yeah. this, this is like distribution. This is the equivalent of distribution of work over uh, a tree of shards of uh, blockchains. Same idea, just different scale. <laughs> um, have, uh, have people used heterogeneous chips in practice? Um, I know we did it in research labs. I don't know about, um, uh, I mean, certainly it's the case that, you know, inside your own computer, you have a GPU and a CPU, uh, and you have, you know, caches that are getting smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you do have heterogeneous chips inside, you know, desktops and laptops. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and Mike Stay, you know, and when we were talking with Mike on Monday, he mentioned that um, the same thing happens in a browser, right? You have a kind of execution model for HTML and you have an execution model for JavaScript. And yeah. those two things are different, um, but they are, they are intertwined when you're talking about rendering web pages. Um, so you get he this heterogeneous execution model even in the browser. And so, you, so th these are, you know, three, three different ways of thinking of <laughs> a practical examples where you have these heterogeneous execution models, uh, potentially heterogeneous consensus models, um, and they're wired up to give you a total experience. Yeah. Um, and so you want to be able to reason about end on end um, correctness. And this is where typification becomes really interesting because um, you want to be able to show at a, at a much higher level um, than each particular chip uh, or each particular node in a network um, that uh, you, you can expect things to go um, according to plan, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so the typification part helps with that, um, but it, it's only going to help to the extent that we have a good model of... Um, of sort of composite uh, or heterogeneous um, uh, computational uh, frameworks. And that's where I, I think that, <laughs> you know, a lot of the work that you're doing um, can begin, or, you know, that you and Mike and I are, are sort of bashing our heads against, um, can, can, um, can help with, with our understanding of this. Um, yeah. So, so in, in particular, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're, you're thinking about the, uh, the arrow type um, in, in your setting? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so for me, it's, it's easiest to think about uh, just sets and functions if I could just explain it that way first. Sure, go for it. Yeah, so, um, so if, you have, if you have two sets A and B, and you're thinking about programs that get you from A to B, and then you have a subset of A um, called U, and that's something like uh, a type here, Mm -hmm. And then we have a subset of B, which would be some resulting uh, type that we want to get out of our programs. Then you could think about, uh, you have the set of all possible functions from A to B, but then you want to restrict to only the functions that, who map, U inside of B, so that um, there are the programs so that when you plug in something of type U, you get something of type V. Um, so this is sort of like uh, a, it's like a function space, but you're restricting it to this condition that 
uh, I only want the ones that if, the, if you plug in something of this particular type, I'm going to get something out of this type. And this is something that you can construct in very general contexts. And um, we can apply it to uh, the theory of some language, like the theory of the row calculus. And essentially what it allows you to do is take uh, any pair of types, which are usually like a, two subsets of processes, and then you form the arrow type, which would be the, the subset of contexts, processes with a, with a hole knocked in them, so that when you plug in something of the first type, tau, uh, the resulting, once you substitute it in, the resulting process is of type tau prime. So that was the original um, equational arrow modality um, that, that I constructed and then Greg, um, you know, was reminding me that it needed to incorporate the aspect of rewriting. And then in the past few weeks, uh, we've worked that out as well. And now it's, um, it's weakened to say, give me all programs uh, or give me all contexts so that when I plug in something of type tau, then one step forward from that is of type tau prime. So we can do this for any theory with rewriting. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the literature, this is commonly called rely guarantee. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I can rely on, um, you know, some computation, call it P, to, um, to behave like tau, um, then the composite computation um, can, will be guaranteed to behave like tau prime. Yeah. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that we've, um, I, 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 I sort of gave this, uh, I gave this talk in, uh, in DevCon 2 in Shanghai, where I talked about how we're shifting from the functional view, which is like, like wires, if I can rely on something going into the wire um, being of a particular type, right? So the, so I, I look, the wire has a particular socket um, shape on one end, then I can guarantee that what comes out the other end will be of a particular type, right? Um, so that's a, another socket uh, mm -hmm. shape, right? So th that's, a, that's a functional view of this, but you could also look at it from, from the point of view of a motherboard Right, so I've got a motherboard with a particular place where I could plug in another processor. So if I can rely on that processor that I plug in or that component that I plug in to behave in a particular way, uh, then the overall board will behave in, in another way. So that's another visualization, but it's a shift, right? It's no longer a, um, um, uh, a data centric view. The data has to have a particular shape in order for the going in in order for the data coming out um, to have a particular shape. Now we've shifted from data to program. So the, the component has to have a particular behavior in order for the, um, for the overall component to have a particular behavior. Uh, and that's, that's the shift. Uh, and, and it's an important one if we're going to talk about um, properties like um, uh, <clears throat> Um, being live, so free of deadlocks or free of some kind of deadly embrace, or if we're going to talk about properties like not leaking secrets, um, those are those are two um, those are two important properties that we might consider in general, and 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 we might want to apply those to, for example, heterogeneous um, uh, uh, blockchain networks. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's one place, and of course. We might want to apply the same kinds of, we want to seek those principles or those properties um, also of uh, web pages. <laughs> so the web page doesn't get frozen or stuck um, or leak secrets uh, from, uh, you know, uh, a user application out to the wild and woolly internet. And likewise, we, would, we, might, uh, we want, might want to apply those very same properties to the uh, um, 
to, to a situation where we're tiling uh, the surface of an FPGA with a heterogeneous chips. Yeah. So th th those are all places where we would, we would look for um, at least those kinds of properties and, 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 and many others. And so having this uh, rely guarantee kind of um, definition at the level of generality that, uh, that we're doing in Ladle and uh, Christian did an admirable job of describing is, uh, is important because we're, <laughs> we are talking about uh, supporting and reasoning about a wide range of different kinds of um, computational phenomena. Right. That was, yeah. That's, and ho hopefully this set, sets up the, uh, the motivational framework for, for why Ladle is being um, uh, developed at, at the level of generality that we're talking about. Yeah, it, it seems like this is really going to be extremely useful. And it's, it's been definitely gratifying to see how this program is very general and can be can be stated for basically any language you can think of, any language that can be formally presented and not just, not just rolling. Um, yes. And it's also interesting to think about like, uh, it seems like a language like the row calculus is one of the few that has, partly because it's concurrent and partly because of the reflection, uh, has the the right kind of expressiveness to to phrase properties like safety and liveness um, using uh, using the ladle types, and I was wondering like if those kinds of properties are um, might be more difficult to say in other languages. Are you picturing like that you compile other programs into Rolang and then use the the nicer namespace logic kind of types there to check if they satisfy the behavioral properties, or so do that, you think that you can say them in any language? That's a really that's a uh, a great question. Um, you know, it, it it cuts to the heart of I think. Recently, um, Dan uh, Connolly was ha, had put forward a um, a translator from JavaScript to Rolang. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, uh, uh, because it you know because what what he wanted to do was to in, empower uh, you know th there's this huge uh, development community that that writes in, in JavaScript, but doesn't write in Rolang. <laughs> um, and so he wanted to empower them. But of course, you know, it, it cuts both ways in the sense that um, uh, the, the, you can't pull back um, a lot of what makes Rolang expressive and powerful and e easy to write down those kinds of safety and liveness properties. Uh, in, back up from Erlang into JavaScript, right? Yeah. And, the, and the reason is because you're going to be piling on all of this this extra logic that is related to the interpretation. Yeah. Um, and uh, another way to think about it is Rolang has syntax that, you know, makes makes it possible just with your eyes to see where the concurrency is. Um, in JavaScript, that's all done in logic. You can't see it in the syntax. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and as a result, um, uh, it, it becomes next to impossible to type check uh, because the, you, now, now you're asking, you know, halting hard problems, <laughs> yeah. uh, halting hard questions, uh, you know, like you have to go and inspect the logic um, and, as opposed to just look at the syntax. Yeah, uh, and so that's so it's 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 an interesting double-edged sword. Um, I've I've run into this this kind of thing in the past where, uh, you know, I would I would paper paper over the um, the concurrency formalisms with something that people were more familiar with, but what that does though is it just it just makes people more likely to 
continue to use the things they know. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but but I, 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 under, I understand your motivations here. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it, it's going to be an, an interesting question. And, and I'm hoping that it becomes the kind of, um, the, the, the kind of experience that motivates people and pushes people towards the concurrency-based languages. Uh, right, because yeah. it becomes harder and harder for them to write down at the type level um, the kinds of security and safety properties and liveness properties that they'd like to write down because it's uh, harder and harder to check in, you know, uh, languages like JavaScript or Java or sc even Scala. Um, uh, whereas in, in, uh, in Rolang, um, uh, the, it, it's organized in such a way that writing down those kinds of properties is relatively straightforward. Um, yeah, so I think that'll be a huge motivation uh, or a, a force towards towards switching over. I I, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, I, I think that would be. Uh, I would I would I would love to see it. I would love to see it. Um, it, it, it moving. Legacy code is hard. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I, 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 I continue, even to this day, to be astounded at the hegemony of JavaScript. Yeah. Everybody knows that JavaScript is broken. Um, it's, it's just really bad um, as, as a, uh, a language in which to express a user-defined, you know, um, user-defined behavior um, because there's tons and tons of things you'd like to do concurrently um, and so you know it, it's much more much more reasonable to have a concurrency based language right at that juncture yeah but uh, but JavaScript uh, and, and it's much more I mean even even if you don't buy that argument <laughs> Um, uh, it's much more reasonable to have a typed version <laughs> and, and there I know the industry agrees with me, right? Because collectively Google and Microsoft and Facebook have all spent hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> correcting that one error. So. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean when it comes to this composite, composite language idea, uh, I think Mike was talking to us recently about the idea that once we have these other languages also formally specified and, and communities have been doing that, mm -hmm. then we can input them. Uh, we, can, we can plug them into this, uh, this type algorithm mm -hmm. and we can treat it as a composite language in which we could make tweaks to inject more of the philosophy of Rolang to add a little bit more of the features and um, so that people could work uh, with a language they're familiar with, but start to see um, more of those benefits directly. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this, this is like the uh, communicating sequential processes idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know the a actor model is also very, very similar in spirit to this. Like, the, um, you know, um, it's like one one way to think about it is, um, uh, you know, there was there was a desire to move um, programmers to typed functional languages, um, and so you know, so you. You're starting from C and you're trying to get to Haskell, <laughs> right? So, so the, the, the first step is just getting them into a garbage collected <laughs> situation. So, so what, one data, one point along the way is Java, right? Yeah. And then, and then from Java, another point along the way is Scala, right? So you can kind of keep splitting the difference, um, mm -hmm. Right, and so so inside Scala, people are still able to write in a very Java-like manner. Uh, inside Java, it's really hard to write in a C-like manner. That's yeah. <laughs> that's tough. Um, but but uh, but you know you can you can begin if you want to to avail yourself of of these more um, uh, uh, advanced features that that 
will make your code more expressive and, and, and more checkable. And so, yeah, that, that's something that, that could happen with, uh, with at an accelerated pace within the kind of framework that we're talking about here. So yeah. and it's an interesting, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. I hadn't, hadn't been thinking about that per, uh, particular aspect of it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, anything at all to, 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 um, because, you know, Moore's law is a distant, <laughs> A distant um, object in the rear view mirror um, and so uh, we programmers are going to have to embrace concurrency um, whether we're talking about the the fact that the you know the transactional networks are happening concurrently or the fact that you know all applications have to be you know available to con concurrent use 24 7 or or the fact that you know it's the whole game in terms of scaling at the hardware level is, you know, more cores per die, um, you know, more, uh, more chips per, per box, more, more racks in a, uh, in a data center kind of thing. All of that is, is, you know, the pressure to, to be able to take advantage of the concurrency is now enormous, which means the programming model has to change. That that part is inevitable. That that bet is already over. <laughs> yeah, we can't just keep cashing in on extractivism and just keep assuming everything can just grow, and we don't have to think hard. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but the, but the, the, these trends they take forever. They take forever to to shift, uh, and and so that's that's part of the. Uh, it, it's very difficult to predict how, you know, what, what the events are that create these shifts. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, everyone that I knew um, back in the 80s knew that the DARPA net <laughs> was going to be a major economic force. Mm -hmm. We all knew that networked computing was going to be the future. Um, but none of us predicted Netscape, right? None of us predicted, um, you know, that some physicist uh, from CERN would build, you know, the application that changed everything. Yeah. Right. Even though we all knew that there was going to be some watershed event, none of us could predict, you know, um, uh, the World Wide Web and Netscape and, and everything that, that happened as a result of that. Uh, so the same, the same thing here, you know, we know that these changes are inevitable, but we don't know what the watershed event is. I keep hoping that Rolang provides enough of, you know, the specifics <laughs> uh, that, that, it, that it could potentially be that, you know, that, that droplet that crystallizes the entire solution. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I think, I think it is, or, I mean, once you put it together with this, with this logical program, it just um, and the fact that it applies to all languages, and and you can start to, you know, um, affect or influence the philosophy of the other languages directly. I think that's when you start to have real um, leverage over the transition. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. Um, well, maybe that's a good place to, to end the conversation for today. Um, I really appreciate your engagement uh, and uh, the work you're doing is phenomenal. It's uh, quite an inspiration. Um, so uh, looking forward uh, to the next RCAST and um, stay safe, be well. You too. Thanks for having me. Ciao, ciao.